This is Biden's America. I wanted to show you two different examples of what Joe Biden's America means, particularly in relation to the 2024 presidential election. First of all, is a brief clip from President Trump's advisor in the White House, Peter Navarro, speaking at the CPAC convention before, as he puts it, heading to prison. This means, look at what's going on. Democrats, Biden, Garland, and Smith, Bragg, James, and Willis, and a sizable chunk of the radical wing of the Democrat Party not only want to stop Republican Donald Trump from retaking the White House, they want this presidential titan, and I was there when he was that titan, and providential titan who kept our nation in prosperity and out of war for four beautiful years. They want him to die cruelly in prison. We must face that reality. If you don't believe they may, may well succeed, just, just look at my own situation as I stand before you on this stage as a former high-ranking Trump official now just weeks away from a prison cell. The parallels between my own and Trump's case are indeed striking. I am the first, the first senior White House advisor ever convicted of contempt of Congress. Trump is the first former president ever, ever to be criminally indicted. I was put in leg irons by armed FBI agents who far more easily could have asked for my voluntary surrender. Trump was the target of an equally unnecessary armed FBI raid on Mar-a-Lago. I was indicted by the Biden-Garland Department of Justice despite a more than 50-year policy against compelled congressional testimony by senior White House officials like me. DOJ's, DOJ's hypocrite prosecutor would falsely argue to my jury that I had acted above the law and they knew damn well I was simply honoring the Constitution, fulfilling my oath of office, and obeying the law, the Department of Justice's own Office of Legal Counsel had long articulated and supported. Now, here's the deal. Listen carefully. Trump likewise faces a dizzying array of charges and more than 700 years in prison based on equally novel and baseless applications of laws and statutes that have been tortured and twisted by partisan prosecutors. Then there is this. You must know this. Every single major actor in the prosecutions of both me and Trump are what? Democrats. Yet the Democrats and their useful partisan idiots in the legacy media, aka the fake news, want you to believe our prosecutions are not political. No, nothing to see here. In my case, a Democrat House majority held me in contempt on an overwhelmingly partisan vote. A Democrat-controlled Department of Justice indicted and prosecuted me. A heavily skewed Democrat jury right here in the District of Columbia featuring members who had expressed anti-Trump sentiments in voir dire convicted me. Trump similarly has been indicted solely by Democrats. Here's the deal. The probability of the former president getting a jury broadly reflective of the American electorate, electorate is near zero in the bluest of blue cities of where? Washington, D.C., Manhattan, and Atlanta. Then there is this, and this was a big surprise to me, the utter repudiation in both our cases of Supreme Court Justice Thurgood Marshall's admonition that every defendant has the right to what? To a full and fair defense. By the time my case got to the jury, the judge had stripped me of every possible defense, thereby making my conviction a foregone conclusion. As my attorney said, that can't be the law, but it was in that court. I see the same process unfolding now as I follow the myriad Trump court cases across multiple jurisdictions, Democrat-appointed judges are systematically stripping away the full fair and rightful defenses of Trump. As I ready myself for a prison cell, my question to all of you here is this. What are you going to do as you leave CPAC to protect your own right to vote for Donald Trump if you choose? 
Just what are you going to do to throw those rascals out who just, just a few short miles away from us in the White House and on Capitol Hill and at the FBI and the Department of Injustice are doing so much damage to our economy, our border, our national security, and ultimately, you know what, our political institutions, civility, and social fabric. Can you imagine when the FBI agents were placing Trump presidential advisor Peter Navarro in leg chains and ankle chains? I would have told that agent to remember this day that you can tell your children and your grandchildren of the proud day that you put leg irons on a senior elderly presidential advisor on the orders of the Democratic Party and Democrat officials in office. I mean, these agents should have resigned before engaging in such infamy. The other video is a nice interview between Glenn Beck and Tucker Carlson on his interview of Vladimir Putin on the trip that Tucker undertook to Russia. Did something that no other Western journalist in the world has either been willing or able to do in a very long time. He traveled to Moscow to speak to Russian President Vladimir Putin. And right on track, cue the collective outrage. Tucker Carlson is dangerous. He's a Putin lover. Will they ban him from coming home? Is the EU sanctioning him? The news was actually kind of hilarious, and it still is. Take any war in history, I don't care with whom or which leader, and any journalist worth their salt, they'd be chomping at the bit to interview the leaders on both sides. But not this one. Why? Why is journalism now a crime to journalists? Because I'd like to start with... <laughs> The history of the Beck family starting at 800 BCE. So, uh, what did you make of what did you make of that? Well, I was enraged because I thought, um, you know, I didn't go into the interview feeling like I had to, you know, posture morally. You know, I took a look at the last interview you did with a Western journalist, and the entire interview was the reporter from some dumb news outlet being like, "I'm a good person, you're a bad person," you know, and that. <laughs> I, I'm not interested in proving I'm a good person. People can assess. God can assess. You know, I, I, I just want information. But I was infuriated because I thought he was filibustering. I asked him a really pretty straightforward, the obvious question, which is, why did you do this? Why did you send troops into eastern Ukraine? And he goes on this long answer. And so I interrupted him a couple of times. I tried to. He got very snippy. And then I realized, no, this is the answer. And, you know, he just thinks differently. I've never met him before. So I'm wait, 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 wait. On so I don't understand. <laughs> I don't understand the story because I had the same question you did at the very end. So are you saying ancestral homelands should be yeah. given back to right? Because that, where does that end? <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't believe in that anywhere. Yeah. Okay. Right. Neither do I. Not giving my house back to the Passamaquoddy. Okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> I feel sorry for people who are displaced, but I, you know, I, there has to be a, a statute of limitations. So I thought it was a silly argument to make. I'm not sure he was making an argument. And moreover, I'm not sure I understand exactly what he was doing. So I shouldn't pretend that I do. There's a lot about that interview that I don't really understand. I don't think he was very effective if his no. goal was to win a Western audience to his perspective. It didn't make me pro more pro-Putin. No. Not that I was. Um, and by the way, I should just say at the outset, I've been accused of being pro-Putin and I'm not. But if I was, that's OK, too. Right. I'm an adult man and an American citizen. I can like or dislike anyone I want. I can have any opinion I want. I'm not ashamed of it. And the idea that like a small number of people in DC get to decide what I believe I know. is not something I accept. So, you know, so I reserve the right to like anybody. Right. Period. And I and I want I mean you like me. It can't go downhill more than that. <laughs> um the uh I want to get to that here in a second. But first, you had a uh, a tough time. The first time you tried to interview interview Putin, the NSA was involved. Yeah, they they read my text messages and leaked into the New York Times. How do and you I'm not know? Guessing, it, but okay, how do you know? Well, because someone who worked there warned me through a very close, very close friend of mine. Um, and I won't bore you with the whole details, yeah, but yeah. I flew up to Washington to meet this person at his request. Da, 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 da. I couldn't believe this. It scared me. 
I immediately called a U.S. senator. I don't know very many U.S. senators well, um, but there's one I thought seemed kind of trustworthy. So I said, I just want to get this on the record. This has happened. Um, and then members of Congress went to NSA and they admitted that they had read my email. Um, and so it's, I wasn't and I went on TV and described the whole thing, and I you, thought there would be widespread out of it. I am. I thought people would be like outraged. You can't. No. You can't use a spy agency that we pay for, whose job is to monitor our enemies, our rivals in other countries. You can't use that against the American population, and no one seemed to care. But I cared. I did because I grew up on the U.S. government. My dad ran a federal agency in Washington, so I sort of knew what the rules were, and I had to really. Uh, p strong sense of how much this had changed. Like this was not allowed 30 years ago. It was no. an outrage. It's a crime, but no one seems to be bothered by it. But so, I am bothered by so it. So I, I am going. too. And I think every citizen should be, especially journalists. You know, when you have freedom of speech, freedom of press, there's two rights that are going away here. Um, and, uh, and nobody seemed to care. So this is incredible that the NSA was reading Tucker Carlson's text messages attempting to set up an interview with the president of Russia, as if he was a national security threat. And then the NSA, working for President Joe Biden, then sent this information to their friends at the New York Times. Now, the New York Times should have been offended at the NSA spying on an American citizen, a journalist, doing his job of journalism. Instead, the New York Times published this. Tucker Carlson's lesson in the perils of giving airtime to an autocrat prompted fresh criticism on Friday of the right-wing host's recent interview with Vladimir Putin. Well, why isn't the New York Times interviewing Vladimir Putin? Isn't interviewing world leaders your job at the New York Times? Apparently not. What the Biden administration did with regards to Tucker Carlson is something that should frighten every American, the entire Republican Party should have been demanding answers and holding hearings of the Biden administration. Why are you spying on a journalist? But instead, it looks like the Republican leadership couldn't wait to authorize Biden's war. Does the Republican leadership work for the American people? I don't know. I have no idea who they work for. But in early 2022, the Republican leadership was cowed into silence. They didn't want to go against the Democratic Party and President Biden. White House accused Senator Hawley of parroting Russian talking points. If you are just digesting Russian misinformation and parroting Russian talking points, uh, you are not aligned uh, with uh, long-standing bipartisan American values, which is to stand up for the sovereignty of countries like Ukraine, but others, uh, their right to choose their own alliances, and also to stand against, very clearly, the efforts uh, or attempts or potential attempts by any country to invade and take territory of another country. Uh, that applies to Senator Hawley, but it also applies to uh, others who may be parroting the talking points of Russian propagandist leaders. What did Senator Hawley actually say? The senator said he favored the U.S. sending assistance to Ukraine, but worried deploying troops to defend Ukraine through NATO obligations for member nations, quote, can only detract from the U.S. military's ability to ready and modernize forces to deter China in the Indo-Pacific. But we can't ask questions of the powerful, because that means you are a Putin lover. You are a Russia lover. Do you recognize Biden's America in 2024? This is not the America I grew up in. Please vote accordingly. Thank you.